It was the deadliest aviation accident to have occurred in the United States. We're going to be talking about American Airlines Flight 191 on this episode of the Taking Off Podcast. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Dan Milliken. I have joining us via phone, Christy. Say hello. Hey. <laughs> hello. Okay, so we may lose you at any minute, correct? Uh, I mean, yeah, you might <laughs> lose me at any minute. I, I'm on call today for work, and so I have to be available. So if crew scheduling calls me, I'm going to have to bounce. But as of right now, it looks okay. I just want to make you aware. You're going to have to bounce and go up to DFW and jump on an Embraer 175 and be the first officer. Is where I saying? hope... Exactly, where I hopefully won't have to do a bounce and go. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Christy, we're talking about American Airlines Flight 191, which, by the way, the flight number 191 is pretty significant because not only the deadliest uh, United States uh, ac aircraft accident was Flight number 91, Delta Airlines Flight 191, 191 was the one that crashed in DFW in the 80s. Yeah, and what's crazy about that, so the Delta 191 happened on my third birthday. So I wow. know I totally just gave away my age, but uh, yeah, it oh happened gosh. on August 2nd, 1985. I just started a new job in college. That's really horrible, the age thing. When Delta, yeah, when Delta happened, yeah. So uh, that, the whole Delta 191, I looked into that, but when I was, this was like several years ago when I was really getting into aviation and very enthralled with aviation accidents. And then when I was looking up accidents, I happened to come across American 191. And that one, I don't know what it was about that accident, but it, la it left a lasting impact on me. Like a very lasting well, impact. It, it was a very impactful crash, besides being the deadliest. Um, you know, this was in 1979. I mean, just to give our listeners, it was May 25th, 1979. It was a DC-10. I wasn't born yet. You weren't born yet. <laughs> I was. It was a DC-10. <laughs> And what was significant, this isn't uh, long before everybody had a camera in their pocket with their cell phone. And it just so happened that somebody was playing around with their DSLR camera, or not DSLR, SLR, excuse me, there was no digital. This is a film camera. I was going to say, and it was way ahead of its time. Yeah, they were, yeah they, were, they were playing with their SLR, which I had one back then. And they happened, they were just taking pictures, and they just happened to take pictures of this plane as it rolled over and it those were the impactful lasting memories just looking at that just was unbelievable i mean the plane is flying banked you know perpendicular to the ground it's just incredible in the pictures yeah planes are not supposed to do that for anybody who's unaware yeah not airliners um certainly no They're not, supposed not to be like doing that. aerobatics um okay so let's run through do you want to tell people exactly what happened do you want me to um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm absolutely happy it. to, I know, I know quite a bit about this particular accident because like I said, it, it was one of those that just hit me early on in my aviation career. And I looked really into it because, um, for a lot of people that don't realize, uh, back in the day, I was actually kind of timid. I was a little scared of flying. When I say back in the day, I mean like, you know, 20 years ago and, when you um, were two. this, yeah, right. Basically. Uh, and, um, you know, I did my first uh, airliner flight when I was 10 years old, and it was a very thrilling but kind of scary uh, flight for me because when you're young and you just don't know, it, it's the same thing with adults too, right? What you don't know tends to scare you, and I didn't know anything. And so um, when I was in my early 20s and really looking at getting into aviation, that's when I started looking up these air crashes because – we learn from them, right? It's not that I have a morbid curiosity. I have a curiosity for learning so that we don't make the same mistakes over again. And this is one that just really hit me because it was a structural failure. Um, so basically what happened was um, without getting into uh, exactly uh, what caused it to happen. Yeah, because we'll cover that. Basically, yeah. exactly, yeah. So what happened is as the... It was a uh, it was a DC-10, which again was like my favorite airliner growing up. That's another reason why it really hit me. 
as the DC-10 is on its takeoff roll, all of a sudden they lost their left engine. And but by I mean, loss, like they you actually, don't, yeah, yeah, <laughs> they actually lost their left engine. Like it came off. The, yeah. So, um, for those that don't know, the engine is attached to the wing via a pylon. There was a structural failure, which we'll talk about later, in right. the pylon assembly, which caused the engine to literally it kind of jutted down, broke off, and then as the airplane started to rotate it caused the engine to swing upward and over the wing itself. As it was breaking off, it severed the hydraulic lines, in, which are really important for the, especially in this case, the slats, those leading edge slats, which help the airplane produce lift. Uh, it helps at the wing speeds, produce right. lift at slow, at slow speeds. So it, the engine comes off, severs the hydraulic lines and the slats just due to the aerodynamic forces they reach because the hydraulics actually keep the slats extended and so with the loss of hydraulic pressure those slats came inward and the left wing lost the lift the airplane effectively went into a left-hand bank the first officer was the one flying and at the time so what we're taught as airline pilots is we pitch for a certain speed and he pitched for your takeoff safety speed, your V2, he pitched for that. So he actually pulled the airplane back to about 14 degrees nose up to keep that V2. Well, what happened is he had inadvertently stalled that left wing because they didn't realize that they had lost their slats. All this happened in a matter of seconds. Um, the airplane banked hard to the left. There was at this point, I mean, it was only a couple hundred feet in the air. Right. There really was no way to save it. And it wound up, you know, falling out of the sky and crashing. I believe it was like into a trailer park home or something it was just off the airport. Not, not into the trailer park home, but really close by. And it killed two people on the ground. Right, exactly. So now in training, uh, we are taught uh, as airline pilots, we pitch for V2 plus 20 knots. Right. Um, so that was something why. that came out of this crash. One uh, thing I do want to point out about the what happened and why why he ended up stalling it and again it's not the fo's fault at all but because he didn't no. know and here's here's why not only did it sever the hydraulics but all the electrical or the significant electrical systems were being run routed through that as well and that was killed and so right. all electrical and what that meant is that the slat warning light was killed the um all sorts of things were killed. And what's really freaky is that was back in the day where they actually put a camera in the cockpit looking forward for the takeoff so that people could watch on the, the television monitors in the cabin. And so this – they don't know if the, the if that lost power or if the passengers Ugh. saw their demise. I mean that's what's yeah, really that's eerie about it. And that, I think they but stopped But I mean on, honestly – I was going to say honestly though to – like they're going to see their demise anyway. It was right out the window. You know what I mean? Right. So it's not like when it's not like it, they didn't yeah. see what was. Yeah, it's not like they didn't see what was happening. But but either way, it's it's still a tragedy. And so, and also um, one other yeah, factor yeah. too on the on the stall, the FO was flying back then, 1979. It was an optional feature to have the stick shaker on the FO's side, and all the airlines in saving money said, "Yeah, we don't need that." So explain what a stick shaker is and how important that was that the FO did not even get a stall warning. So a stick shaker is a fact. Well, we get several stall warnings in, in flight, especially in the airliner. It's like it'll tell you that you're approaching a stall. It'll And then the stick shaker will go off. And so a stick shaker, it basically, there's like a little rattler, if you will, that's in the base of the, the yoke um, that comes out of like the floor. And... It'll, I mean, I've dealt with stick shakers a bunch of times in the fight, in the simulator uh, for work when we're doing training. And it, as you're approaching a stall, it'll start rattling and it rattles the whole stick, if you will. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory stick right. shaker. But 
it's it's not when the airplane is stalling, it's as the airplane is approaching a stall. It's kind of like what we talked about on our last one or when we talked about the uh Colgan. The, the Buffalo crash. Yeah. Yeah. He got the stick shaker, which told him, Hey, the airplane Warning. is approaching a stall, you might want to push forward. Exactly. But instead of pushing forward, he pulled back. In this case, um the the stick shaker, I mean, it wouldn't have mattered. Because they were, he, he would have heard it. Even if he was, you know, not getting a stick shaker himself, he still would have heard the stick shaker on the captain's side. But, I mean, you're talking, they had not even seconds to react. They had milliseconds to react. They, And I want to reiterate that the pilots in this case, they did nothing wrong. They did exactly what their training yep. told them to do. So he pitched for exactly what he was, to, you know, supposed to pitch to. And um, unfortunately, they they had no way of knowing that they had lost their slats and that they were in a completely unusual, untrained for event. So here's which now now we train for. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that one established a whole bunch of stuff. The captain was Walter Lux, age 53. And Captain Lux was not supposed to be on this flight. He actually was done for the day. And was had left the gate where he had just arrived when a friend captain of his said, hey, look, I really got to go do this thing. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Can you take this flight for me? And he said, well, OK. And so Captain Lux's family didn't even know he was on that flight. That's incredible. Yeah, that's. Ugh. Yeah. Very... Could you imagine like you're just trying to do a solid for a friend? Right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Golly. So, and and one other thing about the electric uh, electrical being cut is that it also killed the CVR, the cockpit voice recording for the last fifty seconds. So, as soon as that engine detached and severed the hydraulic and, ele and electrical, they had no more CVR. So, we don't know what was said in the cockpit as they struggled. Yeah, for the this. last fifty seconds. The last thing that. The last thing we heard them say, we heard the FO say, damn, and right. that's it. And so then we, the recording I mean, ended. so it's exactly, it's impossible to know whether or not they knew the severity of what was happening, you know, and, and the struggles that they were facing. So I, I, they might have known, but I highly doubt it. If they would have known, I mean, I have to believe that, that if they had known they lost their slaps, which are a key component for the oh, yeah. aerodynamics of the airplane in takeoff and landing, I believe that they would have pitched over and made some other changes. Yeah. They, and, it probably the would have been a non-event. They would have brought brought it around. In mm -hmm. the simulator after the crash, they were able to successfully make it by, you know, um, exactly what you said. So they just didn't know. And so that's why it's been incorporated in the training. One other note about, well, a couple other notes. So the engine, when it detached, you know, of course it had thrust. Um, by uh, eyewitness account of uh, an American Airlines aviation maintenance supervisor who was watching the takeoff and saw the engine, he said that it actually had a little bit of lift. And so the engine, when it detached, came forward and up, never impacting the wing itself. It did sever the hydraulics and electrical underneath and inside, but it actually went up and lost the lift and thrust and and went over the wing backwards uh, into the runway. Uh, so, I thought it actually hit the wing as it was detaching. No, it, it was just the, the act of detaching is what separated the hydraulics and the electrical. And gotcha. I, I think, Interesting. I think they redesigned some things about that. I'm not sure. But um, well, okay. So now let's talk about why the engine separated. Because I don't yeah. want people to think that if they get onto an airliner with under, you know, right. hanging wings or uh, engines from the wings, that it's going to start just detaching. This was a very a significant well, it, event that led it, to a lot of a lot of changes, eye opening changes. Yeah, but but yeah. something I want to point out real quick before we get into why, because it is critical. I do want to say something. The NTSB did a press conference really soon after um i can't remember exactly less than a week maybe maybe or definitely less than 10 days and maybe even as soon as two days afterwards in which they found a huge bolt that holds the engine to the pylon and they had found it on the runway and the ntsb lead 
in front of all the cameras, holds it up and says, we found our culprit. The NTSB was under such pressure with this deadliest crash ever to have an, a reason, to have an answer right away, that they didn't do their homework and they just jumped to conclusions. It was not what caused the accident. And I want to bring this up because for all of us who complain about the NTSB taking too long, it's because of this kind of thing. If, if right. they had just gone forward with it, yeah, it sounded good. It looked like that's what the culprit was. And it wasn't. And had we gone with that and not found out the real reason, um, these important safety changes might not have been made. So, right. All right. So what happened? Why did it separate? Okay. They were doing some maintenance in the maintenance hangar. And basically what it came down to is they improperly, they were trying to cut corners, uh, save time, which, you know, cut down on costs. So what they would do is they would take the, you know, forklift, lift it up, change out the bolts, and then lift the forklift, you know, bring the forklift back down, bing, bada, boom, you've got, you know, your your parts and components and the pylon assembly changed out. But they screwed up. They let the pylon assembly, I guess they it hung too long. And well, then they it was did it during change. like a shift change. A shift yeah, change. they did it during a shift change. And that caused a lot of physical stress on the uh, pylon itself, which caused breakage and all this other stuff. Well, they didn't realize it because it was internal like micro cracking. And um, that's what caused all the uh, the chain of events, if you will. Um, it was a big deal. I read some things about the mechanics that were actually working on it. And yeah, I I just don't even want to talk about that because they, they suffered internally, emotionally, uh, after that, it it was a big deal when it happened and it led to a lot of changes in the maintenance department in terms of them not, uh, shortcutting anymore as well. Yes, so. yes. And and it was, you know, you had the engine attached to a pylon and the pylon's attached to the wing. And right. one way to do it is to pull the engine off the pylon or another way to do it is to pull the whole engine pylon assembly off. And they did pull the engine as- and pylon assembly without taking the pylon off, which I believe was acceptable. But, uh, but the, the way they did it by using a forklift um, – to hold the, the forklift was underneath the engine. And so they could release it from the pylon and um, the hydraulics of the forklift settled during the shift change, um, which caused, what happened is caused the front of the engine to dip, which caused the back of the engine with the pylon assembly to go up. And it went up into the wing, which caused um, some metal bending and fatigue of that rear connection to the pylon. And so months later, uh, in 1979, because this was maintenance was months before, I think, or month or months, it was before. And when the engine separated, it was because the back of the pylon separated, which caused the engine to swing up, you know, because of that thrust and then up and over the wing. Right. So Exactly. Um, what else? Okay, you've talked about what's come out of that as a whole bunch of new pilot things, the V2 plus 20 on an engine out. What other things did the industry change um, after this crash? Um, uh, it definitely, uh, I know that there was a lot of changes, a lot of cracking down on maintenance procedures. Um, another thing, though, that came out, it there was some other issues with the DC 10 at the time. And all this did was just hurt the DC 10's reputation. And it actually um, proliferated its downfall effectively airliner. I think it was grounded. In fact, it was uh, FAA grounded it shortly after, um, before they knew exactly what had happened. Uh, They grounded all DC 10's for a while, just like the 737 max. Right. Yeah, they grounded it. But so, once they found out um, that it was the improper maintenance, uh, they ungrounded them. 
but it but the damage to the reputation yep. of the airplane was done and so it, it really like you can see throughout the 80s they start using the DC-10 less and less, which is such a shame because the DC-10 actually was a really well-built airplane. It's a really, really good airplane. Well, but, when, um, when you look at the crash later of uh, the Sioux City crash uh, for United of that DC-10, um, cartwheeling, and it's still a significant number of people survived. It was an incredibly sturdy airplane. Right, exactly. So... You know, it's just it's stuff like that. You just look at it, and um, it's kind of like the the Electra, the Lockheed Electra back yeah. in the you know fifties and sixties. It went through a um, it it went through some changes in its structural design. It was a really weird freak accident type scenario that caused um, a couple of high profile crashes. And unfortunately, the damage to the reputation was done. And even though they went back and they re-engineered it and they strengthened the structure, I mean, the electric just never came back um, for a couple of reasons. One, because the, the damage to its reputation, but also because the jet age was coming about and kind of superseding the, the piston aircraft and, and the turboprop aircraft. But uh, either way, it's the same thing. I mean, if there was crash after crash of like a triple seven, for example, um, and it was due to structural integrity, I don't think people would want to fly on a triple seven. It, people would lose confidence. Look what's happened to the 737 MAX. You know, in the aftermath of what happened with that, people lost confidence. And even still, I mean, I still yeah. hear people talking about it. Yeah, I, so. I hear people saying, I, heard, I saw a question on social media. Um, when I'm booking an airline ticket, how can I make sure it's not a 737 MAX? And Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's too bad because it's, so you gotta it's be a careful. great airplane. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. So you just you have to be careful with stuff like that. And unfortunately, you know, it wasn't the design of the aircraft. In this, in the case of uh, American 191, it was an unfortunate series of incidents that happened uh, in the background revolving maintenance that led. To, I mean, if you if you improperly do anything, you can cause structural damage to an airplane or a car or anything. And I mean, you could put a tire on incorrectly on a car, yep. and you're going to cause a physical stress and damage. But at the end of the day, it it could cause damage to the reputation of that that vehicle or that aircraft and that's what happened we still see them you know flying around the skies they're, they're, yeah, they're primarily used mostly used for, for cargo. freight yeah freight and cargo yeah. fedex had bought a, quite a few of the dc-10s as well as the uh the next generation the md-11s the md-11s yeah which yeah are basically the same thing by, almost almost the same thing by the year 2000 pretty much all the in in the u.s at least all the uh, dc-10s for passenger service had been had been removed. The the DC-10 also it was a perfect storm in the early 80s of a downturn in the industry plus all these really high profile crashes. Yeah, the buyers lost confidence in the DC-10 and um, yeah, so that was and I think that it also helped um, kind of quicken the pace in which McDonnell Douglas ended up getting bought out and all that. Yeah. I mean, it, it like, a, a, these were just the, a one link and the change, one ripple in the pond that led to everything else happening. So yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that it happened. It's unfortunate that so many people lost their lives for a stupid mistake. Um, and as you like to say, oftentimes new policies and lessons are written in blood. This was definitely one of those cases. Yeah. And by 1997, McDonnell Douglas had merged with Boeing. So Boeing was able yeah. to kind of take them over. So, and I think it was partly because of this crash and, you know, some of the others. Um, Absolutely. All right. Well, um, very sad crash. Um, you know, yeah, we, we've learned in blood. And so a lot of new policies and procedures were put in place. And, you know, 1979 was our deadliest, you know, our most, yeah, deadliest aircraft accident. Um, it's nice to see in the industry that we haven't had something like that repeat. So you guys are doing something right I there in the ATP. I absolutely agree. Airline world. So, all right. 
Well, you didn't get called to go jump on a 175. Not yet. So we made it through exactly, the podcast. Exactly, not yet. <laughs> and appreciate you guys listening. And if you're listening on the YouTube podcast, just know, you know, the video is, it's not there for video. It, we may put pictures up, but that's about it. And I should have said that at the beginning. But um, anyway, we appreciate you guys listening to the podcast. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Thanks, Christy. Yeah. Yeah, bye.